But yeah, check them out in Sainsbury's anyway, in the sausage area. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go and check out the sausage area. <laughs> it's the first thing I do when I get to Sainsbury's. <laughs> User error 55. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. I'm Dan. And we're back. And don't forget about the forum, which is at community.error.show. Some of the stuff today comes from there. You can uh, have a chat with people. There's some interesting conversations going on over there. So yeah, do check that out. Sign up and uh, submit your hashtag ask error questions. You can do that on Twitter and Telegram and stuff as well. And you can email us. Well, let's start with a hashtag ask error then. It won't be long before self-driving car sounds as ridiculous as horseless carriage. What do you think they'll be called? If uh, history tells us anything, it'll be some brand name. <laughs> it'll be like, you know, it'll just be an Uber or a, a Lyft or, you know, like Kleenex, right? Like you don't say you get a facial tissue, it's a Kleenex, right? So whoever is like the ubiquitous self-driving car brand, like that's what people will call it. Oh, hang on. Are you are you saying what the new thing will be called or what the old thing will be called? I'm saying what cars that drive themselves will be called. Huh. I was thinking, what will people call the cars from the past? You know, those old stupid things that you actually had to sit in and manually uh, fiddle around with a gear stick and turn a big steering wheel. That was just ludicrous. Who would have done that, right? Oh, uh, what, like snail mail or yes, whatever? Yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> precisely. I hadn't thought of that. So you think they'll just be called cars and then old school cars will just be called old school cars or something? Suicide yeah. boxes. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Death traps. Yeah, totally. I, I think we, the the name will co go along with the new technology and people will just call it a car or, yeah, I think they might call it an Uber or whatever brand has it. But I think the thing will get renamed is the old thing. So about two years ago on Christmas Day, I published a post on my blog entitled, Lying to Children is Never Okay, Even About Santa. And in this slightly tongue-in-cheek blog post, I talked about how the downfall of Western civilization will be brought about by this lie that all uh, parents tell their children. Now, when I found out that Father Christmas or Santa was not real, I was not very pleased about that, that I'd been lied to by my parents. Apparently, that makes me a bit strange, and apparently even bringing this whole thing up makes me a bit strange. So, I don't know, I wanted to talk to you two about it. Popey, you've got kids. They are too old to believe in Santa by now. Presumably you did lie to them about it when they were young. Yeah, we totally did the whole um, plate with a mince pie and a carrot on it and uh, a thing of whiskey by the fireplace on Christmas Eve. I've got videos of us, like, setting it all up with them. And... You know, it's part of that magic to get them to go to bed, and you know, and it's part of the the whole th human nature of lying to people in order to get them to do what you want them to do. Like, it's no different than governments and religions. Like, it's just that on a smaller scale. It's no different at all. They all lie to the people beneath them in order to get them to do what they want. And I want my children to be good, so I lie to them and tell them that Father Christmas won't bring them any presents if they're not good. It is as simple as that. It's just a coercion, but it's also it's a group lie. So it's a thing that you and other parents know you lie about and you all do it and that makes it okay. I, I don't know. I think that uh, we simplify things for kids, right? Like the world is too complex for them to comprehend. And, and so we have to prevent them with simple models that they understand. And something like the myth of Santa Claus is easy for kids to get. That's an incredibly patronizing view that the world is too simple for children. Have you not met children? They're idiots. They're clumsy. They don't know where to put food. They drop stuff and they don't know how to speak properly. They're, they're idiots until they're like 10 plus years old. And so they need to be helped in order to get through life. Otherwise, they'd end up killing themselves on something if we didn't look after them. Right. Yeah, that is true. Okay, fair enough. But why do you need to lie to them about this thing? Why can't you just say, if you're not good, then I'm not buying you a Nintendo Switch for Christmas? You can do that. That is that is entirely possible. Why not? Uh, because it's quite nice to have the whole Father Christmas thing. It's actually quite fun and builds excitement and makes them think that actually that 
it's not just a case of um well there's this is also a religious thing he's watching you you know um you know they can see you doing what you're doing and when you're doing it badly he will know and you won't get your present whereas if i say if you don't tidy your room or you don't you know do all the right things i won't buy you a present then well he didn't see me so that's okay he knows i'm not in the room i can't see him all to, all the time whereas haha all seeing eye of father christmas and his elves or whatever stupid story you spin like god or whatever can see you but that is not an acceptable answer as far as i'm concerned okay like, aren't we supposed to be trying to get away from um stories like god and you know it how isn't truth valuable enough that we don't want to lie to children and make them grow up thinking that lying is okay we do this in school too right like a lot of concepts are way too complex for children and we have to simplify them to the point where we tell them things that aren't necessarily true so they can kind of grasp the idea and then when they get to the next level up we tell them okay this is actually how it works and then we do it again oh, okay that this is actually how it works this time right like we do that all the time with all kinds of things that's not a lie though is it that's more of a a metaphor like you know the the obvious one is um i don't know the nature of reality matter and stuff how you have this uh you know orbital idea of electrons around the the, the nucleus of the atom which is just complete bollocks that's not at all what it's like but it's a handy visualization of that i don't think you need to go down to the atomic level it's just as simple as when their puppy dies like what happened to the puppy oh he's in a better place you calm them down because if you actually said to them uh no it, he's no longer conscious he's dead like he has ceased to be there it's it's a hard concept to grasp death for a five six year old child and so often they are lied to and they're told no it's gone to heaven or it's gone to a better place doggy heaven or he's he's with his brother the other dog who died last year you know that whatever story you spin in order to make it easier on them because it's pretty brutal to hear a, a, i would imagine a, a five six year old that no that dog is dead and that's it end of life well extrapolate is that what happened to Nan? Is that what happened to my uncle? Is that what will happen to me? Will I just cease to exist one day? Yep, that's it. Suck it up, son. Well, yeah, then it'd toughen them up, wouldn't it? A five-year-old. Yeah. Get a grip, Joe. I know I know. you play the part of being a prick <laughs> that doesn't like children, <laughs> but come on. They are actually human beings. You can't you can't treat them like that. Why not? Because it's brutal. It's 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 a horrible thought to have it's bad enough when you're an adult to think that do you know what one day i'm going to drop down dead and um the people who i leave behind are going to be very upset about that because i've i've dropped down dead now i know you probably don't believe that and we've talked about death in the past but f f that's hard enough for for a grown up to grasp for a 5 year old kid no yeah but maybe it's hard for a grown up to grasp because they never had to face it as a kid whereas if they were toughened up as a, you know if I was toughened up as a kid and wasn't bullshitted to then maybe I'd be a bit harder now yes and if we all grew up in gulags that would be fine <laughs> <laughs> well a lie is a lie and uh, it's a good job I'm not having kids because they'd be the ones telling all their friends at school that it's just bullshit there's no such thing as santa and uh it's all just part of the crass commercialization of Christmas. Having the conversation where they figure it out. My, I remember my ex-boss, when his daughter found out, they were <laughs> driving along in the car, and uh, the song came on the radio at Christmas time. I saw Mummy kissing Santa Claus, and she just went, Dad? And he went, yep. And she, and she went, you're Father Christmas, aren't you? And he went, yep. And he looked across and she had a little tear in her eye <laughs> because she's been lied to by the oppressive parents and their lying ways. And she'll never forgive them. <laughs> we had a question on the forum that pretty much boiled down to, do new users still need to learn how to use the command line? And so I thought I'd ask you guys, Dan, I know that you in elementary OS very much strive so that people don't have to use the command line. Um, but do you think that new users should still learn how to use it just in case? No, not really. I don't really see any reason why they would have to use it. Um, there are some things that are still a little bit faster or more convenient. If you know exactly what you're looking for, you know, to do it in terminal. But 
I think for the most part that um, most people, I think in most modern Linux distros, probably don't really need to use it ever. So the question was, do new users still need to learn how to use the command line? I don't think, I think if you're specifically saying new users, and even then you don't have to limit this to Linux, like think about any operating system, any desktop operating system, because like command line on a mobile device is just a bit ludicrous. But um, for desktop computers and laptops, I think no, new users shouldn't necessarily have to be onboarded to the terminal. They, it might be useful that they know it exists and there's this powerful little black box that they can go into and press magic buttons and things happen that are very powerful and seemingly incomprehensible. They should know it's there um, because actually it's used in a lot of support articles for any operating system. If you look on the Microsoft website for how to flush your DNS, you've got DNS problems and you Google for how do I flush my DNS? The answer is you open a command prompt window and you type a command. It isn't you go to this GUI and press this button and here's a video showing you how to get there. It's a terminal and you type stuff in the terminal on Windows. And if you search for how do I make a USB key for my Mac for, to do recovery, the answer is you download the image and then you run a command in a terminal in order to put it on a USB key. There isn't a button you press to put it on the USB key. So I don't think it's unreasonable on Linux. We also have a, a means to do those powerful activities in the terminal. Whether you need new users to be taught about it, hmm, probably not. But I don't think we should shy away from it. I don't think we we need to um, like make out like it's this horrible, dark, mysterious place you shouldn't go. And people, and if it, if it, if you're told you have to use the terminal, that's a bug. I don't think we should go down that road because it's not. It's a powerful tool, and you should be aware it exists. I wonder if we'll ever get to a point where a Linux distro will ship with no terminal installed. Oh, right, and then when your system breaks, what do you do then? Well, exactly. I, the first thing I would do is install a terminal via the GUI software center or whatever it's called. But do new users, I don't know. I mean, I think about my mum as the sort of classic case. She had never really used computers much and she wanted a laptop. And I said, well, we'll leave the Windows partition, but I'll install Zubuntu on it, obviously, um, and see how you get along with that. And if you can't hack it, then you've always got the Windows partition. And she has just never looked back, and she's just totally comfortable with it now. She doesn't do much apart from open a web browser. But at the same time, it, all the updates and everything just pops up. She just clicks OK, and it just does it. That said, I am on hand at the end of the phone, um, and I've, I've almost had to talk her through stuff on the terminal, but I just decided, no, it's just going to have to wait, or I'm just going to have to go around there and sort it out. And so I have had to use the terminal, I think, on her machine. So maybe it is a good idea that new users at least know it's there and, and know some very basic things about it. I think the hard trap you get into with um, using terminal as a support line, though, is that, uh, and we experience this all the time, where users will uh, Google up some stuff and then they'll see some directions for terminal commands somewhere that tell them to do things that are really destructive or uh, have them add some unsecure software source or something like that. Um, and they don't know the difference. They just copy and paste whatever it says. And we've tried to mitigate that a little bit by having like warning messages, you know, parsing those things and going, hey, like this is an administrative command, like be sure that you know what this does. But um, it's really hard, I think, that that kind of copy paste culture of you know just magic support thing is really dangerous <clears throat> my problem with that is if you start trying to um limit the capabilities of the terminal on your platform and you say you know intercept things and say well you know we don't recommend that and you know we don't we don't pre-install that thing for this reason uh, all you end up doing is making sure that the people who are documenting the thing will put special cases in there for your platform to say, and press this when the stupid pop-up comes up telling you not to do that. Or here's the file you need to touch to make those messages go away. Um, and that's exactly what people will do. Like when we introduce stuff in Ubuntu, people will work around it, not nefarious stuff, people stuff that actually helps, helps users. 
but people will write documentation on how to remove it and undo it. So it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter how far you go, people will undo whatever those controls are. So it's almost pointless doing it <laughs> because you, know, you can only do so much and then you're just in a war with the support people and that doesn't seem to be the right way to go. It would seem like doing what Android does is the best way to do it, where if you want to sideload an APK in Android, you have to go and specifically toggle on untrusted sources or whatever. And so buried in a menu somewhere should be a switch to switch all that stuff off. Uh, and then maybe new users won't get into trouble like that unless they specifically know, right, okay, I'm going in and toggling these protections off. Is that something you've ever thought about, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. And we've talked several times about like a developer mode and stuff where um, maybe we do hide things like the terminal by default and then you have to go enable developer mode in order to expose them. Um, I don't know. It It, it is hard because... Um, like Alan said, there is there is this kind of balance where you don't really want to restrict users and you don't want to make it harder for them to do the things that they need to do. But um, there, there are a lot of people who do need to be protected from themselves because they don't understand that um, the things that they're doing with these tools will um, native negatively affect them. And then they take to Twitter or wherever and they say, oh, you know, uh, elementary OS is a piece of crap because when I pasted in this terminal command, like it fried my whole system and put my social security number online, you know, and they, they expect us to protect them from those kind of things. And if we don't do those things, they, they get angry and call our product crap. In the model that you gave, Joe, where the untrusted sources on Android, you talk about you know the experienced user, the you know the expert user can flip that switch and say, "I know what I'm doing." Predominantly, that's not the case. Like a a kid who has a phone and wants to play Fortnite and has to sideload the APK because it's not in the App Store, like they are not empowered. They're not like clever enough to understand i mean they're probably clever enough than most but they're not necessarily going to fully understand the implication of flicking that switch in settings that allows them to download the apk of Fortnite and put it on their phone so it's you've got to balance the needs for all the different types of users not just those expert users who want to you know go fast and press the turbo button and whatever other special controls they want you've got to think of the other people but then there's also like there's your mum with the desktop, but then there's also people who work in office environments who almost certainly will not touch a terminal because that's just not part of their daily workflow. They'll open Outlook and the browser and um, all, all manner of other desktop applications and almost likely never see a command shell prompt or whatever you call it on Windows ever. But they will have someone who will need to, like you, a support person. And so I, I find it quite frustrating when there's this whole, oh, well, Windows does this and Mac does that and um, Linux shouldn't do that because they don't do it. But you've got to remember that everyone needs some support from someone at some point. And those people need those tools, whether it's, you know, you helping your mom or a helpless person helping a Windows user or you know, a guy in the genius bar in the Apple store who's helping a Mac user. The the tools should be there, whether you expose them or not is, is another matter. Well, which brings us back to the original question. You know, I think that we all agree those tools should be there, whether you have to toggle them on or off, but should new users learn how to use it? And I think the conclusion that you two have come to is pretty much no, and I think the answer is yes, they should learn it to some extent, but they shouldn't be forced to use it all the time. But I think that they should, I think computer users on any platform should have a responsibility to learn how it works. I think it was it you, Popey, a while ago made the analogy with driving. You don't just get in a car and start driving. You have to learn how to use that machine. I can hear a, a, a thousand Arch users um moaning at us because you know their experience is you need the terminal to even install the thing so you know new users yes you will learn how to use the terminal on <laughs> day one <laughs> okay hashtag ask error how much do you spend getting your hair cut and how often how much should i spend well how much do you spend zero never have i've never paid for a haircut in my life um, my brother and sister are both hairdressers and they've, since I've been 
a, a kid when I was, you know, under the age of dealing with my own finances. My parents took me to the hairdressers to get my hair cut. And then when my brother and sister became hairdressers, they did my hair. Um, and so all I do is phone my brother and say, when can you cut my hair? And he says, coming at four o'clock and I rock up. He cuts my hair and I leave. Job done. That's cheating. That's super cheating. <laughs> how much would they charge you if they weren't family? I have no idea. I've never paid. So how would I know? <laughs> well, it's never come up. No, because like when they get a virus and they bring their PC around, I fix it. I don't charge them. It's like yeah. family. It's You wouldn't. And when my brother goes on holiday and he wants someone to walk his dogs, I go around and walk his dogs. And I don't ask for payment or uh, ask for anything in return. It's just like... Go get my haircut now and then. And how often do you do it then? Uh, usually when my wife complains. So if she says your hair's getting too long, then I'll leave it a little bit longer and she might phone them and organize my haircut. <laughs> You're going for your haircut on Saturday. Oh, okay, am I? Right. Uh, or I, you know, if I, if I already feel like it and I'm taking one of the kids in, I might get it done when the kids are having their hair, hair done. But yeah, generally I like can't be bothered i let it grow really long fair enough well dan you strike me don't take this the wrong way but you strike me as a bit of a hipster who gets his hair cut frequently and for quite a lot of money um so there's a, a little place uh called jimmy's barber garage <laughs> that of course there is. was of course. uh <laughs> literally like used to be like a little auto garage right and they've converted it so it is very hipstery <laughs> and when you go in um, you know, you take your seat and then you get a free drink while you're waiting. You can either do beer or wine. Nice. And then, uh, yeah. And then, you know, you go back and, uh, it, so including tip and everything, I pay $30, which oh. is, it is expensive, but I get a free drink and <laughs> I like my stylist a lot. She's super cool. Uh, you uh, have a stylist. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's like you can pay you can pay ten dollars at whatever clips cuts super sports center or whatever, and then the lady like knocks your head around and you know and you come out with like the crazy looking like you might as well cut it yourself haircut, you know, or I can I can spend the money and, and get a drink and you know, interact with, with someone who who treats me like a, a nice customer, you know. And how frequently is this then? I go like every other month. Okay, that's not too bad then. I thought you were going to say every other week there. No, 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 no. Uh, well, I am bald. Uh, I used to say balding, but I can't say that anymore. I'm just bald. And my wife shaves my head. She does a wet shave every week for me, usually on a Friday. And so how much is a disposable razor? Uh not very much. So I don't spend very much at all. And once a week is the answer to that. And I tell you, once you are bald and have a shaven head, life is so much easier. There's no pissing around washing it. You know, obviously I w wash my head, but that takes, you know, one second. And there's no having to worry about brushing it or styling it or anything <laughs> like that. So life is well easy when you're bald. You think I brush or style my hair? <laughs> No, I have actually seen it. Yeah, you don't do no, it. No, no. It's basically bedhead all day, every day. Well, you are a tech hipster. I am not. <laughs> I'm middle-aged centrist dad, you keep telling me. I'm not a hipster. Yeah, but you do have a pretty cool job, to be fair. Yeah, it's all right. It's got nothing to do with my haircut, and I had this haircut before I got the job, so maybe that's why I got the job. Maybe. It's uh, elegantly disheveled. <laughs> Shabby chic. <laughs> Okay, so it's nearly Christmas. It's the end of the year. We should be upbeat. I've been a bit downbeat with my Santa lie stuff. So let's have a good positive one. What is the best tech news story that you've seen this year? So I actually think that uh, a lot of the stuff that tech companies have been doing with like health stuff is really interesting. And especially I was really surprised to see um, when the latest Apple Watch came out, like how many features that seem to be targeting the elderly and like fall detection and things like that. And it made me think about like, you know, they have like life alert and stuff like that, right? And these embarrassing commercials that would like, if you bought that product, you would feel like a senile person, right? Like, oh God, I'm aging and, you know, it's embarrassing. But when you have like cool tech products that have these features, 
you know, that's something that is super helpful um, for for an elderly person, and it's not embarrassing. And, and they can have this kind of cool piece of tech that has all of these neat health features in it that it, it actually is engaging and and not something that they have to like feel ashamed of themselves for having to have and it's not even really tech is it if you look at it one way it's a piece of jewelry if you get a nice strap with an apple watch then it's it's not even like a phone or whatever it is just a watch yeah i I think it's super cool um that you know these kind of the features are, are being baked into these wearables i think we're finally starting to figure out like what are wearables for and uh it turns out that a lot of it is health um, on the other hand, though, it is kind of weird that we're heading to this like tech dystopia world where American healthcare is built on the backs of Apple and Google. You know, they they all they have all these warnings. Um, you know, where like the EKG feature just shipped, and when you set it up, they have all these warnings like this doesn't replace a doctor visit. Like, make sure that you know you're discussing your heart health with your doctor and all this kind of stuff. But for people uh, like me that don't have healthcare, I would never know if I had like a heart arrhythmia condition. You know, this is this is something that could warn me about health conditions that I'm unaware of and might make me go, OK, you need to figure out how to go pay to talk to a doctor because I would have never known otherwise. Yeah, it's the time to start making meth button <laughs> or whatever. As someone who does have a, a heart arrhythmia, you would know if you had a heart arrhythmia. <laughs> Probably. The other aspect of that, of course, is that all that data is being stored somewhere and potentially could impact you negatively later in life trying to get health insurance or whatever if you've got underlying problems there and that data clearly shows it over a lot of time then if the insurers have access to that then they could just tell you to piss off and not cover you so the way the way things seem like they're going currently is that they're um angling it as a discount um i've seen this um a couple times where it's like if you have this kind of of data um, and you provide it to your insurer that they'll give you a discount and um, I think that it, it is kind of that troublesome thing where they'll just raise prices and the discount will be the regular price and they'll be like oh no it's a, it's a discount for you to have this but it's not like it's more expensive to not have it and that is kind of a creepy like negative way for things to go is requiring health data in order to have insurance yeah Well, someone I worked with told me that someone they know, so take this with a pinch of salt, but they had some sort of private healthcare that was tied to a Fitbit, I think. And if they did a certain number of steps a day, then they could get it cheaper. And so what did they do? Did they go out running or walking? No, they strapped the bloody thing to their dog and then let that run around and get the number of steps every day. Yeah, that's pretty common. There's a a healthcare company in the UK called Vitality, and they, they do that. They, they do corporate healthcare where you have a, a series of incentives to get you healthy. I mean, it's sold on the fact that it's healthcare. So, you know, in the event that you had a heart attack or, um, you know, your teeth fell out, you could, you could call them and get that fixed. But what they actually want you to do is be fitter so you don't have to call them. And part of that is if you go running a certain number of miles or if you visit the gym a certain number of times or you go cycling or you do these various activities and they have this whole path that takes you through, you know, silver, bronze, gold, and they reward you. So it's not um, – they'll reward you with like cinema tickets or discounts on products and stuff like that to try and motivate you to not use their services, which kind of makes sense, really. You know, insurance companies want to take your money and you not claim, basically. And if they can incentivize you to to do that, that makes sense. And, oh, by the way, you might be a bit fitter at the end of it. It's like win, win, win. All right, so what's the best tech news story you've seen this year then, Popeye? Uh I think the rise of uh, SSL on the web is a good thing. Uh, there was a story back in August on the register about how... Uh, a researcher has discovered that we've gone past 50% of some measure of the web is now SSL and it's climbing and climbing thanks to things like Let's Encrypt, uh, making it easier to generate digital certificates, but also thanks to browsers being a little bit more forceful in telling users, hey, this site's not safe, you know, making it, making it so you have to jump through hoops. Uh, in order to visit a non-SSL site, which makes motivates the site owner 
to want to put an SSL cert on it so that their site is actually visible in in common browsers. I think that's been a good thing. Well, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. As a sysadmin, well, I'm not a sysadmin at all, but as someone who has a web server, um, it has been a big ball ache for me this year trying to sort out SSL and, and find all the corner cases for that and fix them, which I have now done. But uh, it was, you know, for a podcast website, I mean... We've we've talked about this a long time ago, you and me, probably, I think, in Telegram, and how I say, well, why does a podcast website need to be HTTPS? It just doesn't make any sense to me. But I suppose ultimately, if the whole web, if that is just the standard that it's all secure, or relatively secure at least, then that is ultimately better. And I suppose it is a price that you just have to pay for that. But it is annoying We get a flack in Ubuntu because uh, the vast majority of our web properties are SSL, like all the company websites. The wiki has been SSL for years. um, And, uh, you know, community discourse and all that kind of stuff, they've all been SSL forever. But uh, the uh, security packages archive where you get your security updates is not SSL. It's only available over HTTP. And so we constantly get badgered by people saying, oh, you should only deliver packages over SSL. You shouldn't deliver them over HTTP. It's terrible. And, you know, we point out that there are other checks and balances that make sure that what you're downloading is is safe and it has been, you know, signed off by a developer and it only got to the archive and got to be on that site because it's, you know, had the checks and balances, but it has raised awareness to the point where, you know, people are now aware that SSL is a thing and everything, there's this meme that every site should be SSL, um, you know, enabled. Uh, So yeah, it is a bit of a double-edged sword because we get badgered about it, even though, you know, you could argue that it doesn't actually matter for some, some things like podcasts and like things that are already cryptographically signed in some other way. So what's your good news story of the year, Joe? Well, my one is sort of related to yours, and it's really, really boring, and that is GDPR. I think that although, yes, it hasn't been implemented in the best possible way, and it does mean that every website you go to has got annoying nag screens on it that you have to get rid of, but I think that, again, it has raised awareness of data collection and what is actually happening when you use websites and web services, and it's made even normal people start to think about that sort of thing. And with the Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook, you know, that's kind of tied into it as well. It's people's awareness has been raised now. And as like so many things with the EU, it's not perfect and could probably be improved a little bit. But I think fundamentally, the whole GDPR thing is probably the best thing that has happened in tech this year. It has led to a frustration that I visit news sites that are hosted in America and they just shut you out. Yeah, well, fuck them. They don't deserve your traffic. Well, there is that. <laughs> but equally, I'd actually quite like to read that article. And I and I can't because I just get a white page that tells me they're really thinking about the best technical solution to solve this problem that everybody else has solved with a giant pop-up. Um, yeah. Neither are good solutions. A giant pop-up nor blocking me are the right way to solve this. Dan, you're not in the EU, and we won't be for long, but that's a different story. <laughs> but, I mean, you uh, do you see these things? Uh, I mean, I you know, I hear um, people talking about GDPR, right? But um, I... I I haven't really seen any appreciable or noticeable difference, to be honest, in, in any of my web activity. I feel like the the only thing that's like lucidly related was Google deciding they're going to shut down Google Plus because they didn't think they were able to secure it. Um but other than that, I don't I don't feel like that um anybody has cared more about their data privacy or understand how their data works here. Uh it, it's actually incredible when you talk to people how many people assume that all their communication is peer to peer and they have no idea that it's unencrypted on servers somewhere, you know? Wow. So um, I think that the state of of knowledge about data privacy is really, really poor. And, and I don't know if it's improved here at all this year. Has it improved here, Poppy, or am I just dreaming? I've certainly seen an increase in requests to delete data. Um, you know, people who want to, like, write to be forgotten or 
you know, the, the, the ability to, um, have whatever data you're holding on them deleted. I'm pretty sure that's part of GDPR. Um, and I've seen an increase in that in the last year. So we get requests through our legal team of people who've told them, please delete all my data. And so we have to go around all our properties that have any kind of data storage that has personal data on, um, of which we have a few, um, and get rid of them. Uh, or confirm that they never existed there in the first place. But you still have to go through that faff because they asked for it and because it's a legal requirement that you do it. Um, and there's definitely been an increase in that. And therefore a hit to productivity because those people who are having to deal with that should be doing something else more productive. Yeah, I mean, it's not so bad that we're having to, you know, hire lots of additional people to deal with these deletion requests. I can imagine some larger companies might have to do that and larger organizations might have to do that. But um, yeah, we're quite small and we don't, we, we try not to store any user data wherever possible. We go out of our way not to. Um, but in some places, you know, like if someone creates an account on a forum or creates an account in a system where it's possible for them to post data about themselves, then they have, they have the right to then ask you later on to have that deleted. And, and so you have to honor those requests. Now, I know that we're supposed to be being positive, but you brought up Google Plus there, Dan. Now, you post there quite a lot, don't you? So that must have been the worst tech story for you this year, that it's going to be shutting down. It, first of all, it was August, and now it's going to be April. So what are you still doing there, man? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, actually. Um, so I, I primarily use my Google Plus as a place to post, like, work-in-progress stuff for elementary OS. And a lot of times um, it's, like, prototypes or mock-ups or, or um, like, designs I'm working on. And I'm not sure yet where I'm going to start posting that stuff at. Um, originally, I did that on DeviantArt. Um, so I don't know if that's a platform that I want to go back to. Um, I, I had thought about maybe using Dribble more. Um, but, but I don't know. I feel like that, uh, there was something about Google plus that I could specifically engage with like nerds that care about these things. Um, and that's going to go away. So I'm not sure where I want to put that content now. Come on. There's one obvious answer. Mastodon. Oh, I thought you were going to say diaspora. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like Mastodon isn't like super geared towards like image content though. Yeah. And and I, I did think about like looking into maybe some of those um, more like federated, like image based things, or even like poking people to see if they'd want to set up something like a, a dribble kind of thing um, that was more geared towards that type of content. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that, I think that there was something about, um, like the kind of people that were there and looking for that kind of thing. Well, what we need is a new peer to peer distributed platform for people to share photos and comment and stuff like that. And it all needs to be powered by the blockchain. If you've got a sound effect for tumbleweed, you can insert that. <laughs> <laughs>